When it comes to evil people throughout history, we all know the big common names like the evil German dictator and others that are so heinous I'm not even allowed to talk about them on here. But what about some people that are just as bad, but maybe less or no? Well that's where I come in. Question for y'all, who do you consider the most evil person in history? Let me know in the comments and let's talk about some awfulness together. Here's a fun name for me to start off with today, Rappenführer Gerhard Pelich. Now if you've never heard about him before, don't worry, until today neither had I. And I hyper fixated on the mass extinction event in Germany back when I was in high school. He was a non-commissioned officer or NCO of the SS, and notorious for his brutal treatment of prisoners at the very famous camp whose name starts with an A that I'm not supposed to say. On September 3rd of 1941, this man participated in the first tentative gassing, using Zyklon B to kill 600 Russian POWs and 256 Polish prisoners. They were crammed into the basement of Block 13, later renamed Block 11, but not everybody died this time. So this guy was like, all right, let's do it again. Add more of that Zyklon B and let's get this ball rolling. In a report by a Polish resistance fighter, he called this man a particularly dedicated tormentor who would hunt young humans. He told girls to run around a closed yard and then would fire at them, killing them like rabbits. He would snatch a young human from its mother's embrace and smash its little head against a wall or stone. A true degenerate. Tears and death followed him. Having committed a most heinous crime, he would come out smiling, handsome, polite, just calmly smoking a cigarette. This man was the most diligent killer at the Death Wall, which was also called the Black Wall. He bragged personally about having fired at 25,000 people in the back of the head at said camp. The SS actually kicked him out, and even famed commander Rudolf Haas said he was depraved. Once again, this guy was so heinous that the SS said GTFO. That's a level of F dub I didn't even think could exist. After gaining a license to practice psychiatry in the late 1960s, Johannesburger Aubrey Levin joined the South African. African Defense Force, automatically gaining the rank of Colonel. His time in the SADF was marked by his tenure as head of the Aversion Project. The project's aim was to cure so-called deviants. And by that I mean gay people and those who smoked the devil's lettuce. So game over for me and most of my friend group. Throughout the following two decades, many gay men and women were forced to undergo electroshock therapy and chemical castration. And sadly, that's not even the worst of it. The decaying spire atop his church of maleficence grew the 900 victims of forced reassignment surgery, most of which were young men aged between 16 to 24. Many of the surgeries were also botched or just incomplete, leaving victims who couldn't afford hormones in the cold. And hey, the icing on this cake is that you know the leader of this homophobic project would later be proven to have made homosexual advances towards his victims. I hate to say it, but internalized homophobia is a brutal thing. So in 1995, he's like, I'm gonna move to Canada. And here he acquired a license to practice medicine and became professor of clinical psychiatry at the University of Calgary. Yeah, if it sounds like I'm angry, I am. In 2010, he was arrested for harming a patient and then 30 men came forward and claimed they were harmed by him during a counseling. He was tried and convicted for, well, harm, sentenced to only five years in prison, and his medical license was suspended. So a slap on the wrist. Yeah, just like a silly little five years for ruining over a thousand people's lives. Now if it was five years for every person he's ever harmed, that I could get behind. In 2016, CBC obtained information that the Parole Board of Canada had granted him day parole. Yeah, by 2016, he was living in a halfway house and was requesting a full pardon. He was like, Hey, yeah, the, you know, the victims lied, and everybody's got it in for me. Assessments included a scathing psychological evaluation and statements that, you know, Levin appeared to have little concern for his victims, that he was manipulative and presented himself as a victim of the system. He denied that he had any motive or basis for your offenses, and that, you know, he, I'm not aware that that's a criminal act in Canada. It's allowed in my home country. Yeah, we're gonna move on before I start cursing. This might be the most well-known name on today's list, King Leopold II. He deserves inclusion on our list today after what happened in Congo, which he acquired as his private property in 1885 in the Berlin Conference, when much of Africa was divided among European powers. From the beginning, he was just in it for the money, extracting maximum amounts of wealth from this huge colony. Millions of Congolese inhabitants, including young people, were mutilated, killed, or died from disease during his rule. Failure to meet rubber collection quotas was punishable by death. Forced labor was instituted to increase production. Around 10 million people died during this brutal regime. Not that this man cared. 
To paraphrase the title of Frank Zappa's greatest album, he was only in it for the money. Things got so bad that in 1908, he was actually forced to hand over the colony to the Belgian state. Great, add another evil ruler to the list of bad guys in history. Next. Mengistu Haile Mariam rose to power in 1977 as a member of the lethal Derg regime in Ethiopia, which had toppled and killed Emperor Haile Selassie in 1974. His policies were to modernize Ethiopia's economy. Land, companies, banks, and more were all nationalized, and farmers were compelled to join collectives. The free market was abolished. To the shock of the resident nobody, all of that, yeah, it was a disaster. People resisted, famine ensued, and economic destitution was widespread. Which, hey, this didn't stop the big bad leader. Widespread resistance was met with brutal force. And by that I mean between 1.2 to 2 million people were killed during this regime. And according to public record, it wasn't uncommon to see students, suspected government critics, or rebel sympathizers hanging from lampposts each morning. Mengistu himself is alleged to have killed opponents by just garroting or, you know, firing at them, saying that he was leading by example. Yeah, because we need that kind of an example. Human Rights Watch describes his regime as one of the most systematic uses of mass killing by a state ever witnessed in Africa. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, his position became, well, kind of obsolete, and he fled the country. Great, so we got away with it. Go figure. Am I shocked? No, but I'm still disgusted. Here's another beauty, Oscar Dolwanger, who was so depraved that once again he was expelled from the Yahtzee party. Yeah, I... <sighs> Did you know that was possible for today? Like, I guess evil has standards, but like, jeez. He ended up commanding the 36th Waffen Division, which was called Derwanger, after his last name, and his unit was responsible for the deaths of at least tens of thousands in Poland and Russia. Atrocities committed by Oscar included injecting a pesticide into Jewish girls and watching their deaths in the officer's mess. Like, he would just watch them die slowly, and after they would pass, he would cut them up and boil them with horse meat to make soap. In February of 1942, his unit was assigned to anti-gang operations in Belarus, and his preferred method of hunting was to herd the local population inside a barn, set the barn on fire, then fire with machine weapons at anybody who tried to escape. Rounded up civilians would also be routinely used as human shields and marched over minefields. Now, he was eventually caught after everything, but passed before he could be brought to justice. Go figure. Idi Amin ruled as dictator of Uganda after launching a military coup in 1971. His nickname? Well, Butcher of Uganda. Kind of says it all. His behavior steadily worsened during the 1970s as he expelled all Asians and handed over their businesses to his cronies, which led to a collapse of the economy. But I guess the Asians were kind of lucky compared to his violent persecution of rival tribes, which were killed by the tens of thousands. The total death toll of his regime amounted to about half a million out of a population of only 10 million. He was feared for feeding victims alive to crocodiles and boasted that he kept the decapitated heads of political enemies in his freezer. But he's like, mmm. The taste of their flesh? That's a little too salty for me. His megalomania knew no limits. Among his titles were, let's see if I get these all right, Lord of all the beasts of earth and fishes of the seas, conqueror of the British Empire, and more. He was deposed in 1979 and fled to Saudi Arabia, and never expressed any remorse for his brutal deeds. No, not shocked, not shocked. Alrighty, this is the last mass extinction human on today's list, and that's Maria Mandel, also known as the Beast, who was directly complicit in the killings of more than 500,000 female prisoners at the camp whose name starts with an A. On October 15th of 1938, shortly after the annexation, she got her first job under the Yahtzee regime as a supervisor at the Lichtenberg camp, before moving to the Ravensbrück camp, which was purposely built you know, just for women. Here Maria impressed her superiors and was soon promoted because her brutality set her apart from other female workers. In her new role, she oversaw the roll calls and the punishments for the inmates. And by that, punishments like harming, floggings, all the really bad things that people like her considered fun. A survivor remembered that one day they witnessed Maria kicking a fellow inmate to death for just something wrong. On October 7th of 1942, Maria was sent to the Big Bad Camp with the A, and that's where she was involved in the selections something she took great pleasure in. Another survivor recalled how Maria had once selected a small human, whom she dressed up in fine clothing, parading it around like a puppet. The little one was constantly by her side, holding her hand, until she got tired of it and was like, okay, in the gas chamber you go. Like, that's just a level of heinous that I could never be. Mao Zedong was a successful guerrilla fighter against the Japanese invaders and the corrupt Kuomintang government of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. In 1949, he had overcome them all and the People's Republic of China was proclaimed until everything went downhill. In the purges of the early 1950s, millions of wealthy peasants, intellectuals, and saboteurs were killed. Then came the Great Leap Forward, one of the most insane experiments in social engineering ever. Private plots were abolished, 
communal kitchens were introduced, and it was a disaster. Production plummeted, and in the ensuing Great Chinese Famine, cost the lives of up to 45 million people. Not having had enough, a few years later, the Great Helmsman launched the General Proletarian Cultural Revolution in 1966. Millions of people were persecuted and suffered public humiliation, arbitrary imprisonment, torment, hard labor, and execution. When Mao died in 1976, the country's per capita income was lower than the Congo, and China had lost over 55 million lives. Not that Mao cared. Purity above everything else. Well, his purity. Alrighty, has anybody ever heard of Beda Kiss? He was a Hungarian serial killer who lived in the beginning of the 20th century. Although the number of people he killed is not that astonishing in comparison to some others, his ways of killing made me put him on today's list. One day the army went to his house during the war looking for gasoline. Because they're like, he's got a lot of that. The airtight top of the barrel, you know, it was sealed with lead, but it had been loosened. And when people pried it open, there was a really bad smell. What was in there? Well, they took off the lid, and a bag was found. And a woman's body was found sewn into that bag. There were over 20 barrels in all, each with a body inside, and all of them were, well, uh, pickled. I guess the booze sort of helped with that, and the authorities discovered that Kiss had lured the woman to his house by placing an ad in the local paper looking for a wife. Police found that the bodies had puncture marks on their necks, and that the bodies were drained to the life source, which led them to believe that Kiss might have been practicing vampirism. Now, he faked his own death in 1919 to escape persecution, and even though there were numerous sightings of him over the years, he was never caught or apprehended. How'd you guess? And we're going to end today with a personal choice, Carla Homolka. She's a Canadian serial killer who was complicit in at least three killings and more harm with her husband Paul Bernardo, and among the victims, her own sister. She attracted worldwide media attention when a controversial plea bargain with Ontario prosecutors meant she was only convicted of manslaughter, whereas Paul received a life imprisonment and a dangerous offender designation. Carla stated to investigators that she was just an unwilling accomplice in all of this. However, videotapes of the crime surfaced after the plea bargain and before the trial, proving that she was a more active participant than she had originally claimed, including in the case of her sister. As a result, the deal that she had struck with prosecutors was dubbed in the Canadian press, the deal with the devil. So how does she qualify under history trying to hide her? Well, she's out. She's free. She's living in the world with the little one she gave birth to. Which, uh, something about that doesn't sit well with me at all. And that brings us to the end of our time. So I've been Alexa, your resident emo girly, and I'll see y'all next time I buzz in over here at Bumblebee.